This is the Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. And now, Eric John Phelps. And again, I say welcome to the broadcast here at 24-7 World Radio with with Eric John Phelps. As we will be reviewing some things today that I think you'll find quite intriguing and quite interesting. First hour is going to be concerning the transformation, the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ before Peter, James, and John. And the other topic of interest that I hope to fully cover is what is called the executive office of the president. The executive office of the president, headed by a most devoted Irish American Roman Catholic named Dennis McDonough, trained by Jesuits at Georgetown University, and as the chief of the White House Chief of Staff. He is the most powerful man inside the White House, directing Obama to do what he's to do on order from the Jesuits at Georgetown University. That's the American government here today in America, this military government, which every patriot, which every red-blooded American that loves historical white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and Baptist, Calvinist, constitutional liberty, ought to be highly outraged. So, I'll be covering that in the following hour. But today, we'll deal with this wonderful and glorious transfiguration of the one true Son of God sent by His Father to give us His words. And he that does not take heed to the words of the Son of God, the Lord will require it of him, pursuant to Deuteronomy 18, 18. He is that prophet. He's that prophet that was promised, one like unto Moses. He has come. He has paid the price. He has suffered. He has entered into his glory in heaven with the Father, expecting his enemies to be made his footstool, because they haven't been made his footstool yet. And his second coming, when he takes into himself his great and mighty power and will reign on the earth with us, with his church, with his bride, and we will participate in his earthly government at his second return, in which he will reign over the world for 1,000 years. This is if we're going to read the Bible literally. If we're not going to read it literally with regard to prophecy, then let's just forget prophecy. Let's forget the book of the Revelation. And by the way, for those of you listening that you know who you are, I did a little research on the date of the book of the Revelation when it was written, and it was never written during the reign of Nero. The book of the Revelation was never written during the reign of Nero. According to Irenaeus, one of the earliest church fathers, and a couple others, John was exiled to Patmos by Domitian. And when Domitian died in 96, John returned to Ephesus from the island of Patmos and there died in Ephesus. Now those are facts. Now if you want to say that the book of the Revelation was written before the destruction of the second temple, before 70 AD during the reign of Nero, I guess you want to do that, but it just ain't so. Okay. So that's the historical fact of the matter. Now going on, transitions. The transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 9. Verse 23 and following. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my, of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. He's talking about the second coming there. It has nothing to do with the appearing of Christ for the church. This is his second coming. He's talking to Israel. There is no church in existence at this time in Luke chapter 9. There is no body of Christ. It doesn't exist. It's yet to be established in the future after his resurrection. So this is what he says here in the first opening verbs, or first opening words. He says, we are to take up, and the principle is for us today, those of us part of the body of Christ, there are principles here that are true for us, that we are to take up our cross daily and follow Christ. We are to follow him daily. I mean, really, that's the only purposeful, real, meaningful life. I mean, I'm 62. I just turned 62 this last year in December. And I think to myself, apart from the few per times the Lord has used me, the entire life is worthless. And for those of you who don't know Christ, and you're living completely in and of your own desires and selves, your entire life is not only worthless, it's a testimony against you at the great white throne judgment when you will be, your life will be reviewed. And especially white American men. Because you see, the vast majority of white men in this country hate the Lord Jesus Christ just as much as the Muslims do. So what's the difference? The Muslims are just honest about it. They hate his guts. God has no son. They put it on their in their writings and on their mosques. God has no son. But the white men of this country that have inherited a wonderful historic white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant and Baptist, Calvinist written constitution and bill of rights, the white men of this country hate him. I was just reading an article yesterday where in Oklahoma showed these uh, construction, white construction workers with their concrete saws uh, cutting out uh, the Ten Commandments that were posted on public property there. My God! Getting rid of the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. The Ten Commandments ought to be posted everywhere because when an honest man walks by, he's going to say, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do those things. And that's exactly the conclusion God wants us to come to, that we can't do it. And therefore, since we can't do it, what shall we do? Men, brethren, what shall we do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What? That he, the Son of God, died for your sins, was buried and rose again, commands all men everywhere to repent. That's where God wants to bring us. But you know what? The Ten Commandments are the, are the schoolmaster, the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Galatians. It's the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law is good if I use it righteously. And the law is a good tool to bring people to Christ because if you ever told a lie, yes, then you're a liar. Have you ever meditated adultery in your mind with another woman? Why, yes, why, then you're an adulterer. All these things, the law convicts us of our sin and our guilt, which is a good thing. It brings us to the place where we know we're sinners and we know we're guilty, and hence we need a Savior. But, oh, no, we're going to cut that down. We're going to throw it out of our culture. We want nothing more to do with the Scriptures. Oh, God, help us. Could they throw the Bible out of the schools in 1963? The Supreme Court, the Warren Court run by that dirty, filthy, lying murderer Earl Warren and his disgusting, lying abomination of his Warren report, concluding there's only one shooter, and he was a 33rd degree Freemason, what, the governor of California in the past. You know, you know who was one responsible for rounding up the Japanese and throwing them into concentration camps? You know who was responsible for that? Earl Warren, the white apostate 
Protestant, Lutheran, 33rd degree Mason, lapdog of the Pope of Rome, and servant of the Jesuits of Georgetown. The white men of this country want nothing to do in their lives, in their regular daily lives, of following and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the vast majority of what is called the church today. If you're looking for a church to attend, my friend, as Calvin would say, <laughs> good luck. They're all using some perversion. Or they're all incorporated, they all have 501c3 status from, the, from, the, from Ignatius' revenue service, collecting the revenue for the military government. Or they have become surety for a stranger and they're surety for the all caps name through their baptismal birth certificate. And so as a result, the white people of this country, the white men of this country, I don't blame the women. I mean, the women have done as much as they can to destroy the white male. There's no doubt about it. But it's a judgment of God upon the white men for not doing our duty. Why do you think we have all this black on white crime everywhere? It's a judgment of God on white men because we haven't done our duty. Why do you think we have all these alien Roman Catholics flooding into this country, hating our guts, stealing our, air, our lands, running our children off the playgrounds? You know why? Because we white men have refused to do our duty. Why do we have all these perverts ruling in Washington, D.C., Harry Reid and Obama and Joe Biden, and the list goes on and on and on? You know why? Because we white men who believe the Bible have not done our duty. That's why. So don't tell me how bad the Muslims are. They're just honest in their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. We white men want to keep it a secret. We white men really don't want to talk about it, but that's how it is in our hearts. We hate his guts. So God's just fomenting a war between us. He's fomenting a war between his two enemies, the vast majority of white men in America and the Muslim world. And the CIA is busy fomenting it, working for the Pope, the Catholics in action. You see, when we don't do our duty, God unleashes our enemies against us. When we don't take up the cross daily and we don't have a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ to defend his holy name, to preach the gospel and contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, no matter what it costs us, that's what we get. The reason why we have the destruction of Western civilization is because white men, and especially white men who are members of the body of Christ, refuse to do their duty. I don't want to pay anything, and I don't want to spend any time learning anything, and I think I can be free. You're out of your mind. Christ says, we're to take up our cross daily. Principle holding true for the church. He's not talking to the church, but the principle is true for us. And follow me, for so whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. What's the big deal in losing our lives for Christ? We all have an appointment with death anyway. This bag of bones made out of dust and water is going to have to go back to the earth anyway. We all have an appointment unless the Lord appears today. So why not die well? Should we not die well at the post of duty and honor? Listen, death is easy. Death is easy compared to living for the Lord and doing his will. That's effort. That takes yielding. That takes purpose. That takes drive. That takes discipline. That takes, that takes your utter drive and determination and resolve to do the will of God today. But a bullet to the head, man, that's easy. A cutthroat, that's easy. Bleed out in 15 minutes, you're done. But living for the Lord's a hard part. So why not die well, doing the Lord's will, whatever it is for us? Wherever you might be. For what is a man advantaged? 
If he gain the whole world and lose himself, he'll be cast away. I'll tell you, that verse, every white American man ought to be reading. Because the vast majority live for business. And how much money we can make. And how we can move up in the houses that we live in. Sell this one, make a little profit, move in the other one, blah, blah, blah. A, a, a life totally devoted to commercial enterprises and very, very few moments of time devoted to asking significant and relevant questions. Is there a God? And if there is, do I know him? And if I don't know him, I need to. Because we have the testimony of Romans that we know there is a God. We just have to brainwash ourselves that there isn't one. God has revealed it to us. There is, in fact, a God. We see the witness of creation. Now, the question is, who is he? That's why he gave us the Bible. That's why he gave us the record of his son. And hence, therefore, we have an obligation to seek him. Have you sought him today, my white brother? Are you seeking God today? And don't deceive yourself into thinking there ain't no God. Oh, there is. <laughs> And he's working all things after the counsel of his will. And he has your very breath in his hand. And he can snuff you whenever he wants to. That's the reality of the situation. Everybody in this country is busy acquiring things. Homes. Cars. Status. Clothes. And it's all nothing. Unless we know the risen Lord Jesus Christ and our souls have been saved. Be back in a moment. Coming to the Transfiguration. 24-7 World Radio. Well, there John Phelps back with the broadcast here today. Continuing on in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Christ then says in verse 26, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. By the way, he loves that title, Son of Man. That's his favorite title. Not Son of God. He calls himself all the time Son of Man. Of course, this is the gospel of the man, Christ Jesus, here in the book of Luke. He's Son of Man. He's second Adam. He's the greatest of all. He's God manifest in the flesh with the body of a man. So therefore, he says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. When he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. It's the second coming. My white brothers, there's coming a day when this man, this king of the Jews, this Hebrew Jewish Israelite, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, presently at the right hand of God the Father, as the heavenly high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, ever living to make intercession for those of us to come unto God by him, this man is coming back. This is going to be the great alien invader. And he's going to be, by the way, the great predator. He's going to be the predator. Nothing like the movie Predator. He's going to be a thousand times worse than Predator. He's not coming on some anti-gravity craft. He's coming on a white stallion. With a cape dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And Isaiah 42 says he's going to come back roaring, screaming. You talk about the screaming eagles of the, of the what, what's that, the 100 101st Airborne screaming eagles? They're nothing like the one screaming eagle, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes back. He's the eagle. The face of the eagle on the cherub reflects the Son of God. The Gospel of John. He's going to be the screaming eagle. He's going to be predator. He's going to be the one that's going to kill hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people as he treads the wine press alone outside of Jerusalem when all the Gentile armies come there in their final mad quest to destroy every last Jew. 
That's the second coming of Christ. He's going to tread the wine press alone. Isaiah 63, Revelation 19, Joel chapter 3. It's all going to be literally fulfilled at his second personal coming in wrath and vengeance. And I don't want to be there. I mean, I'm thanking God I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to be on the other side. I'm going to be part of his church, the body of Christ, with a glorified body riding on my horse too. And we're going to be part of the alien invading army to take back what belongs to him as he has equitable title to the whole earth and the devil has no title whatsoever. Nor does his pope, nor do his Jesuits, or any of those other wicked sinners. This is the glorious second coming. This is the hope, the hatikva of Israel. The second, the coming of their Messiah. But little do they know, it's the lowly Nazarene. So this is the second coming. We read this in the book of Jude. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. Verse 14. Saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. This is the Lord. This is God. For those of you denying the deity of Christ, right there. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's coming. He's ready to punish all disobedience once our obedience is fulfilled, and he's going to punish it with his second coming. With his great tribulation, the coming future time of Jacob's trouble for 42 months, and after that, his personal second coming. And that's what Christ was referring to in verse 26. When he comes in his own glory, fathers and his holy angels, now in Luke 9, 27 we read. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. What does he mean by that? We shall see in the following verses, but what he means is, you're going to see the kingdom of God in the person of the king himself in his glorified state. If you've seen the king, you've seen the kingdom. The king is the kingdom. Even human laws today, the sovereign, the kingdom of the sovereign is in his breast. The kingdom is centered in its king. Without the king, there is no kingdom. And so, gentlemen, there's some of you that's going to be sitting here. You're going to be seeing the kingdom of God. You're not going to die. Do you see it? Verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. So he takes these three favorite disciples of him. Oh, oh, Jesus had favorites? He sure did. <laughs> he doesn't believe in universal equality. He sure doesn't. He had his favorites, and it's obvious why they were his favorites, because they had more recourse to him than any of the other disciples. James and John said, why don't you just call fire out of heaven and destroy those people? The Lord said, you don't know what spirit you are. Son of man didn't come to destroy, he came to save. Who said those things? James and John. James and John, they want to sit next to Christ on his right hand on his left. So they went to their mother and said, Mom, hey, we want you to talk to uh, the Lord Jesus for us and say, well, you know, we want, to, we, we want to sit on the right hand and left in his kingdom. So ask for us. He, we asked him previously, but he didn't give it to us. Maybe he'll listen to you, Mom. Because there's, there's two requests for this, you know. They wanted to sit next to him on his right hand and on his left. 
in the coming earthly Davidic kingdom that they all anticipated he was about to establish, predicated upon the repentance of the nation. So, he takes his favorites. Peter, of course, when he understands just who Christ is, he said, Lord, depart from me. For I'm a sinful man. Only Peter says that. Peter says to him, uh, Lord, you're surely not going to go die at, at the cross in, in Jerusalem. Get thee behind me, Satan. And then Christ says to Peter a little later on, Oh, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. I can hear the devil right now. Oh, Jesus, just let me sift Peter. I will sift him like wheat. <laughs> The Lord intervenes, no, you won't. Christ says, but I've prayed for you. This relationship between Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ is really significant. And so obviously, Peter made an effort to draw near to him, as did James and John. John always describes himself as the one whom the Lord loved, the one leaning on his breast. John's the first one who recovers himself after abandoning Christ at his trial and crucifixion and he's one of the first ones that comes back because there he there he goes back John truly loved the Lord John writes the gospel of John in the book of the revelation and he's the only one that magnifies Christ as the lamb of God the lamb of God the lamb the lamb the lamb these three men Peter James and John they love the Lord and so he loved them back. And he did special things for them because of their obedience and their desire to be around him. So he takes all three of them. And he goes up to a mountain to pray. Now, by the way, this Greek word mountain is oros. And it can be translated mountain or hill. Down in verse 37, the same Greek word oros is translated hill. And it's the same Greek word in Revelation 17. It's the city that sits on seven oros, seven hills. Translated mountains in the King James, but it's also equally translated hills. The city that sits on seven hills is Rome, not Jerusalem, you wicked sinners. Lying about that. You know who you are. So he goes on. They go up to a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was white and glistening. He now is transfigured. And Peter, James, and John say, oh, Look at him. Look. His face is glistening. His, his clothes are glistening. Kind of like Moses when he came down off the mount after he'd been with the Lord for 40 days and his face glistened and shone and he had to cover up his face with a towel. Another way that Christ Jesus is likened to Moses. But he's different. Moses was a sinner. Christ was no sinner, virgin-born son of God, outside of the condemnation of, that all of us have in Adam. The, the interested third party, praise God, that breaks in on this terrible human condition where the devil is proceeding against us and where the defendants in absolute helplessness and Christ the interested third party takes up, takes the wrath of God the Father, takes title back away from Satan, and he's now victorious as the interested third party. <laughs> the true alien invader, the true predator. Yeah. At his second coming. But right now in the book of Luke, he's not the predator. He's the Lamb of God. He's going to be a predator when he's the lion of the tribe of Judah at the second coming. You see, a lion is a predator. So 
So his, the fashion of his countenance of his face was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. Now, is this literal? For all you gentlemen that don't want to believe it literally, God help you. I mean, it's literal there that Christ is on a mountain. It's a literal mountain. <laughs> Pardon me. He's literally praying. He literally brought James, John, and Peter with him. His countenance was literally altered, and his, his uh, raiment was literally glistening. And he was literally there with literal Moses and literal Elijah. They were there. Verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. This is recorded in Matthew 2. So here are Moses and Elijah speaking to Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, Son of David, in his glorified state, with his clothes glistening, his glory showing through, and they're speaking about one thing. His decease. And the underlying word there is exodus. The exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. When he will depart this land of Egypt. Cross through the Red Sea of his crucifixion. And enter into glory with the Father, into the promised land of heaven. What a tremendous type of the children of Israel leaving Egypt as the Lord Jesus Christ leaving this world. By means of the cross, the horrible things that he must suffer to then sit at the right hand of his Father in a heavenly promised land. They spoke of his exodus. This is the most important thing of Moses and Elijah. Remember, Moses is the one whom the Lord uses to give all the temple sacrifices. The burn offerings, the sin offerings, the peace offering, all this, all looking forward to the seed. All looking forward to the one Moses is now speaking with on the Mount of Transfiguration. What about Elijah? Elijah in the most apostate days of the nation of Israel, when Ahab was king, and his wicked, filthy wife, Jezebel, worshiper of the devil, did everything she could do to kill Elijah. And the Lord took care of Elijah day by day. He fed him at the brook Cherith with, with table scraps off the, off the table of Ahab, bringing those ravens the food of Ahab and giving it to Elijah, I would imagine. Ravens fed him. Elijah, the one who turns the nation back to the Lord, when the 450 prophets of Baal, when they can't make sacrifice, when, when their devil god doesn't swallow up their sacrifice, and they want to offer themselves, and they cut themselves, and Elijah mocks them. Oh, is your god on, uh, uh, on a vacation? Is he, is he out somewhere? Why doesn't he come back here? What's wrong? <laughs> the mockery of Elijah towards the prophets of Baal. Then Elijah prepares the offering, takes the bullock, cuts it up in pieces, puts the stones in places, digs a ditch around it, fills it up with water, then calls on the Lord, Lord, thou art the one true God. Show thyself, and the Lord sends fire and swallows, laps all of it up, the water, the stones, the offering, and it all. And what happens? The great thing of this is the people turn back to the Lord. Truly the Lord, he is God. Elijah is used to turn the people back to the Lord. In the past, he will be used so again. We'll talk a little more about Moses and Elijah after the break here at 24-7 World Radio. The significance of this is quite intriguing. So Moses, what's unique about Moses? Moses interceded. He interceded for Israel and asked the Lord not to destroy the nation. 
Moses had a burden for his own Hebrew Jewish Israelitish people. I have some, a different sound here for, for those of you at the radio station. A little different sound here, a little background noise. Um, so Moses loved his people. He loved his nation. And because he intervenes and intercedes for the nation of Israel, the Lord doesn't destroy it. He says, Moses, I'll take of you. I'll make a great nation out of you. Just stand aside and I'll kill all these people, these stiff-necked people. And I'll make of you a great nation. And he intervenes and says, oh, no, Lord. Don't do that lest the nation say you just brought him out of Egypt to kill him. Moses was an intercessor. But his life was cut short. You know why? Because the Lord told him to speak to the rock and water would come out. And he broke the type. He hit the rock. He smote the rock and the water comes out so it can feed the nation of Israel in the wilderness. And for that, for smiting the rock, the Lord told Moses, you're not entering in to the promised land. The Lord cut Moses' life short, prematurely. We'll see a little later that Moses is going to enter the land as one of the two prophets. Elijah, Elijah, he's afraid of Jezebel. He has victory over 450 prophets of Baal, and a few days later, he wants the Lord to take him out of there because some witch wants to kill him. Some woman, the man of God running from a woman. God help us. And so as a result, The Lord says, okay, I'll take you out of here. Elijah's ministry was cut short. And his ministry fell to Elisha. And Elisha got a double portion of the Spirit of God that was on Elijah. Both of these prophets had their ministries cut short due to their disobedience and sin. And so what are they doing here? Well, they're talking with the Lord about his exodus he's going to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. And the two men that stood with him. So here they are. Here's the, here's the disciples again. <laughs> attacked of the devil, so when the Lord's busy praying, they just couldn't help but go to sleep. The same thing's going to happen in Gethsemane, in the garden. The Lord's praying, oh God, not my will, but thy will be done. And what are the disciples doing? <laughs> kind of like us. Want to pray for a while, want to fall asleep. We have to work at it. We have to stir ourselves to take hold of the Lord as we pray and work it through, pray it through. It's effort, it's work. You just don't pray with no effort and just going to come out. It's, it's work. Prayer is work. It's effort. So they're asleep, but when they woke up, they saw him in his glory and they saw Moses and Elijah. And it came to pass, verse 33, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Remember, Peter, he always has to have something to say. <laughs> open mouth, in foot, insert foot. Peter had hoof and mouth disease. Open hoof, open mouth, insert hoof. So he's going to say something here, but he was, he was honest at least. He was sincere and he was honest. It's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. What for? He's thinking of the Feast of the Tabernacles that's prophesied in the book of Zechariah that at the Feast of the Tabernacles, all the kings of the earth are going to come up once a year to the Feast of the Tabernacle and Tabernacles and give their gifts unto the king, the king of Israel. 
Jehovah. So Peter's thinking the kingdom's going to be established here right now. Moses and Elijah are here, and, and it's good for us to be here, and let, let us make three tabernacles because obviously it appears you're going to institute the kingdom right here and right now. Moses and Elijah are here, and, and, uh, and, and we can start this kingdom right now. So let's make three tabernacles. One for thee, Lord, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he thus spoke, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. I just love it. This is the father. The father can't be seen. He would kill mortal men. No man has seen God at any time. Only begotten son, he hath declared him. No man can see the father and live. And so he appears in spirit in a cloud and he speaks. And I love when the father speaks because it's always very brief and always to the point. He's not a God of many words. And so he says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. This is a testimony to the world. Almighty God said of the Jesus Christ, this is my son, hear him. Are you listening to the son of God today? Are you listening to his, his, his bidding? Oh, come unto me, all oh, come unto me, all you that are laden and heavy laden with sins, and you're downtrodden, and I'll forgive your sins, and I'm going to give you rest. For verily, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Listen, he's calling you to be saved today, my friend. He's calling you to true repentance, turning from sin and believing this wonderful gospel, good news that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, died in your place for your sins. He took the penalty that we should have taken for our own sins. No, he took upon himself our sins, and he takes the penalty of his father. So that upon his resurrection, God can forgive all those to the uttermost that come unto God by his beloved son. This is what God wants. He wants a populated New Jerusalem with millions of sons and daughters with the likeness of Jesus Christ having his righteousness and their sins are forgiven. You know why? Because God delights in the sons of men. He doesn't delight in man's sin, man's sinful nature, but he delights in man. He made man. He made man in his image. For God so loved the world that's man, man in general, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. John the Baptist is looking to Christ saying, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Why? Because God so loved the world and his elect in particular. But for the love of the treasure, he purchased the field, praise God. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. The father takes Moses and Elijah back up into heaven with him. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. You know why? Because if they would have told anybody, they would have said, you're crazy. Now we know you're crazy. Saying that this Jesus was transfigured before you and his face was white and his, and his garments were white as snow and his face was transfigured and, and, and there was some voice out of a cloud to say, this is my beloved son. Now we know you're crazy. So they kept it to themselves. And in another passage, the Lord says, don't tell anybody until after the Son of Man is glorified. They kept it to themselves. This is the transfiguration. This is a transfiguration. Now, we need a few more details about this transfiguration because we need to have recourse to the prophets. So let us go to Zechariah chapter 4. Now, 
Let us go. Yeah, let's go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Concerning Zerubbabel. This is this, this all-important Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel has both the legal and the natural line of Christ in his loins. You read the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter what? Three or so, and you'll see that Zerubbabel is named in both lines. The line of Matthew is his legal right to the throne. Through Solomon, through Zerubbabel, through Joseph, to Christ. That's his legal right to the throne, validated by the genealogy that was in the second temple. Anybody that denied that Christ was the seed of David, having legal right, all they had to do is go to the temple, have the priest dig it out, and that's right, here he is. By the way, that's another reason why God destroyed the temple in AD 70, because it destroyed the, the provable genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ to the throne of David and anybody else's right so that nobody today can prove that they are of the actual seed of David having both legal and natural right to the throne. There's no Hebrew Jewish Israelite in the world that can prove that and that was sealed in 70. So therefore anybody that had that right to the throne must have been able to prove it prior to AD 70. See how thorough God is? So in Zechariah, we're dealing with Zerubbabel in chapter, in chapter 4, verse 9. Zerubbabel is leading in the building of the second temple after the 70 years captivity. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. The house is the temple. His hands shall also furnish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. The seven eyes of the Lord are representing the Holy Spirit. Seven eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So I put this on my flag of probaptical. Seven eyes, seven eyes of the Holy Ghost. The omniscient Spirit of God. Hence, he is as much God as the Father, as the Son. They answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Now a candlestick, a candlestick was today called a Hebrew menorah, and it has seven candles on it, seven sticks that go up from, a main, from the main shaft. You can see this Jews have it when they celebrate their um, Hanukkah and so on and, and uh, other feasts. This is a typical symbol of the Hebrew Jewish Israelites. That's the symbol that ought to be on their flag. Get rid of that damnable hexagram. That's no star of David. That's the star of Remphan, their God. Got to get rid of that thing and put a, put a menorah on it, put a candlestick on it. So the seven-candled candlestick spoken of here, and on each side of the candlestick, there's a little olive tree. And by the way, in my where we worship in my building, we have a candlestick symbolizing the nation of Israel that's temporarily set aside. And I'm going to get two little olive trees, two little bonsai olive trees, one on the right, one on the left. I'm going to put it right next to that menorah. I told my wife about that a few days ago. She said, I can't believe you. You want to actually want to plant in the house? <laughs> yeah, this, for this reason and for this reason alone. What be these two branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? These two olive branches. What are they? And he answered me and said, Knowest not thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord 
by the Adonai of the whole earth, namely, Son of God. These are the two anointed ones. They're two men. And they stand by the Lord, the Son of God of the whole earth. Right here in Zechariah chapter 4. Well, who are these two anointed ones? Let's read about this a little more. These two anointed ones. In Revelation chapter 11, remembering that the book of the Revelation was written in around 95 or so, for just prior to the death of Domitian, while John had been exiled to Patmos by Domitian, and not exiled by Nero. Reading 11, 1, There was given me a rod, like a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. There's a temple of God on earth after the destroyed second temple of 70 A.D. And the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, which is Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty-two literal months. When did this ever happen in history, gentlemen? If you believe this was written before the destruction of the second temple, never happened. No. Verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These two witnesses are Moses and Elisha. Get back. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Rebecca Foster. Iran. With helps, I'm back with the broadcast today. Continuing on with our topic of the transfiguration of Christ, the two prophets, Moses and Elijah, and his three favorite apostles, Peter, James, and John, that were there in Luke chapter 9. But the question has gone on. Why Moses and Elijah? Well, we answer that question, that their ministries were cut short through their disobedience and sin. And they're going to give an, be given an opportunity to finish up their ministries. See, God is the God of second opportunities. And so, <clears throat> we just read Zechariah concerning the two olive branches. Well, what are these two olive branches? They stand before the Lord of the whole earth, the Adonai, who generally always is the Lord Jesus Christ, because in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, Jehovah, all capital letter in the King James, said to my Adonai, uppercase L, lowercase O-R-D, distinguishing between the use of those two Hebrew words in its English translation, the Lord Jehovah said unto my Adonai, sit thou on my right hand. And it's this Adonai that the two prophets, the two anointed ones are standing by. This took place at the transfiguration. They're busy always standing by the Son of God. Now in the flesh, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. They're his two anointed ones, according to Zechariah. But let's go on. Revelation 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. This is literal. And it's never happened before, as we shall see. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This is reference to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah 4, verse 14. 
If you do not know Zechariah 4.14, then that particular verse here in Revelation 11.4 doesn't mean anything. But ah, we know. We know the prophets. Hence, we know Zechariah 4.14, and now we understand Revelation 11.4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. They're men. They are literal men. They're mortal men. So the Lord is preserving them in heaven in their mortal bodies. Because the first one with the resurrection body is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first fruits. He's the promise of more to come. Nobody has a resurrection body as of right now. Only the Lord Jesus Christ does. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Literally. And devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So anybody that tries to kill these two men, fire is going to proceed right out of their mouth, haw, and devour them. Burn them up. <laughs> I got a little taste of that a few days ago. I opened my, my, uh, my wood burner, and like an idiot, I didn't turn it off and push in the, the uh, what do you call it, the thing that closes up the air draft, and the, flower, the fire leapt out through the door. Thank God I only just cracked it. Leapt out into my face and burst some eyelashes. Can you imagine fire like that coming out of a man's mouth and burning up anybody that wants to kill them? What's going to happen? That's a literal. I have no reason to believe it's not literal. But it goes on in this very literal narration and says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who had power to shut heaven in the past? Who is the foremost prophet of the Old Testament? that had power to shut heaven in the past? Our answer is in the book of James, reciting the prophet Elijah. In the book of James, chapter 5, we read, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then he gives an example. Elias, namely Elijah, was a man subject to the passions, to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elijah is known for shutting up heaven over the nation of Israel for three and a half years when they had no rain. That's why Ahab sent a message, Elijah, are thou the one that troubles Israel? Why? Because you've shut up heaven that it doesn't rain. Elijah is known for this great miracle of his in answer to his prayers that the Lord didn't send any rain on Israel for three and a half years. And then, more power in verse 6 to these two witnesses. And have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Who did that? What prophet in the Old Testament did that? Did not Moses turn the Nile River into blood when he put his rod in it? These are powers of Moses and Elijah. These are men. They are two witnesses. Moses and Elijah are there at the transfiguration with Christ, speaking of his exodus. Moses and Elijah were there with the Son of God before he was manifested in the flesh, according to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14. He were, they're the two 
olive branches to stand before the Lord of the whole earth. They're not before the Father. They can't see the Father and live, but they can stand with the Son there somewhere in heaven in the New Jerusalem. and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Did not Moses have the plague of what the grasshoppers and the flies and the frogs and, and the hail mixed with, with fire and ice, the hail mixed with fire? I mean, all these different plagues, the nine plagues that Moses brought upon Egypt and the tenth one, the firstborn would die. These are the powers of Moses and Elijah. And these are the powers these two men have, these two witnesses, in a future third temple, since this was written after the destruction of the second temple. According to Irenaeus, check it out, and Eusebius. Continuing on. And when they shall have finished their testimony, their testimony that lasts, what, 1,260 days. Yeah. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, this is the man of Revelation 13, the man beast of Daniel 7, verse 11 or so. This beast is a man. He's not a, he's not a system. It's not the Roman Catholic system. He's a man. And this man is going to be taken by Christ in Revelation 19 and cast alive into the lake of fire. He's not even going to the great white throne judgment. He's being judged personally by Christ at the second coming and going right to the lake of fire. Systems aren't thrown into the lake of fire. People are that are unsaved. And the devil and his demons and his evil spirits and his devils. The beast is a man. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, the final pope of Rome to be slain and rise from the dead, to be the beast. His spirit and soul rise out of the abyss, re-inhabit his slain body, and the devil inhabits his body, so he's devil-possessed just like Judas was. And shall overcome them. He rise out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. About the time the beast, the, the Pope rises from the dead to become the beast, the ministry of these first two prophets ends, and that's the first half of the 70th week of Daniel, yet future. And if you do not believe it's future, you do not understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and you err as to the day the command was given to restore and build Jerusalem, which was March, what, March 13th, 445 B.C., proven by Sir Robert Anderson in his great work, The Coming Prince, irrefutably proven. The 20th year of Artaxerxes was 445, not 457 B.C. So, the beast makes war on him, and he overcomes him, and he kills him. See, they're mortal, and they're going to die at the hand of the beast. Moses and Elijah put to death by the seed of the serpent, Satan possessing this man. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom, that means it's full of homosexuality, and it is today. And Egypt, the religion is Egyptian, hence masonry, where also our Lord was crucified. This is Jerusalem. This is the great city of Jerusalem. Babylon in Revelation 17 is called the great city. Revelation 18 called the great city, but it's identified as Babylon. This great city here is Jerusalem, where the Lord was crucified. And the religion of Jerusalem is Masonic. It's Egyptian. That's why you have Egyptian architecture everywhere in Israel. 
That's why Benjamin Netanyahu is a 33rd degree Freemason. That's why all the high Masonic Jewish labor Zionists are high Freemasons. Shimon Perez, in addition to being a knight of the British Empire. All these wicked Jewish sinners busy serving the Pope of Rome and via secret societies, specifically Freemasonry, that the Jesuits authored. So Moses and Elijah are going to be laying in the streets of Jerusalem. And what will the people be doing? What will the people of the world be doing after three and a half years of Moses and Elijah? Three and a half years of smiting the earth with any plague they want to anywhere on the earth? Three and a half years of turning waters to blood? Three and a half years of closing up the heavens so it doesn't rain? Three and a half years of smiting any other portion of the earth with any kind of plague they want to? What do you think the people of the world are going to do? What do you think all the rabbis are going to do? Here are these two prophets testifying of Christ and calling Israel to repentance and to believe on the Son of God, calling for national repentance. They're not preaching the gospel of the grace of God. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And they're calling for national repentance, and nobody can kill them. No rabbis and no Jesuits can kill these two witnesses. How do you think they're going to feel when the beast, the false, uh, the beast uh, kills these two witnesses? Let's read. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. This is all literal. Don't have to spiritualize any of this. They're going to say, the beast, he's gotten rid of these troublemakers. He's gotten rid of these troublesome Moses and Elijah that none of us could kill. Every time we wanted to kill those guys, fire proceeded out of their mouths. But not this man, not this beast. He, is, he was killed and he's alive, and he killed Moses and Elijah. So it looks like he's all-powerful. That's why Revelation 13, 4, the world says, Who is like unto the beast? Who can make war with the beast? Nobody. Because he's possessed of the devil. The devil wanted to possess the body of Moses. When, when Moses was buried, the Lord buried Moses, and then the devil came to get his body, probably wanted to possess it. The Lord sent Michael the archangel to contend with Moses over the dead body of Moses, and then the Michael said to Satan, the Lord rebuked thee. He took the body of Moses into heaven. The devil wanted the body of Moses. So now he's going to get the best thing. He's going to get to kill Moses and Elijah through the beast. Oh, the devil will be a great day for the devil. He'll love doing that one. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. <laughs> they the, the beast killed the Moses and Elijah. Oh, let's have, let's have a party. Break out the booze. Let's start fornicating and committing adultery. Oh, let's have some homosexual liaisons. Oh, we're going to have a party here. Because remember, these people do not repent of their fornication, of their murders, of their sorceries, and of their thefts. That's what they do all the time during this horrible t t time of earthly savagery that's coming. And they shall make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Maybe this is going to happen at Christmas time. Maybe it's going to be December 25th. Oh, deck the holes with balls of holly. -la 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 -la. They have killed Moses and Elijah. -la 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 -la. That where their dead bodies are in the streets, let's have gifts, let's have a celebration. Cut down the tree, put a star on top. Oh, let's have a wonderful night because after all, the tree symbolizes the slain Pope risen from the dead with a star on top. The star is a five-pointed star. It's the devil. The devil has his victory over all kingdoms, all nations, through his beast, through his Antichrist, who now has killed Moses and Elijah. And the Antichrist is going to start his rule for 42 months. Out of Jerusalem. And everybody's going to see it. You know why? Because everybody's got their iPhone. Everybody's looking on their iPhone. Oh, there's dead Moses and Elijah. There they are in the streets of Jerusalem. Everybody's going to see it. Yep. 
and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. You know why the two prophets tormented them? Because they would, these people, the people of the world, will not repent. They will not repent at the preaching of Moses and Elijah. And so they send them plagues. And the last thing unregenerate man wants is to be punished for his sins. It makes him matter and matter and matter and matter. Amen? So they're going to have a party. We're going to have a party tonight. A party tonight, I know. I tried Moses and Elijah dead in the streets of Jerusalem. Let's have a party and get down. So that's what's coming when they're killed. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a, voice, a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was, was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in Jeru the city's Jerusalem, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. They don't know God. Whoever he is, we just give glory to the God of heaven because he brought these two prophets, Moses and Elijah, back to life. And they ascend up to heaven in the face of their enemies. I'll bet that'll be thrilling for those guys. <laughs> when, they're when they're not resurrected, but when they're made alive again, they're going to get their resurrection bodies at the first resurrection after the second coming of Christ. Okay? They're not getting resurrection bodies now uh, when they're raised. They're just going to be raised like those raised from the dead after Christ was crucified. They came out of their graves. They spoke in Jerusalem, but they later died. Remember that in Matthew? But how will Moses and Elijah feel when they're raised and they're ascending to heaven in the face of all their enemy Jesuits down there, all gritting their teeth because Moses and Elijah are back. They're risen. They're alive again, and they're ascending up in heaven. You know what? I can imagine Moses and Elijah, when they're ascending up into heaven, they're going, <laughs> laughing as they're ascending into heaven against these wicked sinners who take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder. Let us cast their cords from us. No, that ain't happening. We're rising, and this is just the beginning for you people because you're going to go through the six seal judgments, the se seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Amen. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, come up hither, come up here. <laughs> By the way, those of us in Christ, we're going to be watching this from heaven. It's just going to be delightful. Listen, heaven's not a boring place, man. I, if I forbid my, forbid my two sons to ever use the word boring in my house, you will not use that word boring. Life is too exciting and, and tremendously unfolding and real in the light of the word of God. Nothing is boring in the light of Scripture. And we're going to be there in heaven totally enthralled with what's going on. <laughs> I would imagine we'd be there saying, yeah, that's right, Lord, you raised them. <laughs> They're laughing at their enemies. Oh, oh, Lord, how long before you take into your great and mighty power and reign? Oh, God, how long? How much longer we got to wait? And that same hour, there was a great earthquake. We have the city falling, a tenth of the, of the falling, seven people are slain, and they just give glory to the God of heaven. They don't even know who he is. 
The Jews don't know God. They have no idea of who Jehovah is. Their wicked Talmudic, Jerusalem Talmud religion that hates God, it's nothing more than the codification of the wicked doctrines of the Pharisees. They hate God because they hate his son. They have a religion secretly put upon them by Rome as the Talmud was written in Babylon in the 6th century and there were Roman priests there overseeing it just as the Quran was written in Rome. Those wicked religions intended to blind the two races that only have scriptural promises, the Arabs and the Jews, to, to bias them against the true Son of God and the Father that sent him. Well, God's going to bring back his Hebrew, Jewish, Israelite, his people. He's going to work on them. He's going to bring them through double trouble. And this is the beginning of it right here. When the beast comes to power, slays Moses and Elijah, they come back to life. And then ultimately the, the seals are opened. And the first four seals are the, uh, the beast riding different horses. It's not the four horsemen. It's the one horseman riding, being described as by the four horses that he rides. You don't want me, the Lord? Why, then you can have a beast to rule you. And if you don't want me, the Lord, you can have war and no peace. And if you don't want me, the Lord, you can have disease. And if you don't want me, the Lord, you can have famine. That's right. And probably one-third of the world's population will be killed through those seals alone. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. I'm afraid of God. I love him, but I'm afraid of him first. Then I love him second. And the fear of God will keep us from much evil. These people have no fear of God before their eyes. It's a world that has no fear of God before their eyes. So this is what they're going to get. And the two prophets were sent only to the house of the lost sheep of Israel, I maintain, to Jerusalem to begin to call that elect nation of the Hebrew Jewish Israelitish race called the Holy Seed and the Holy People by virtue of the Abrahamic covenant that is still in full force and effect. And I don't care what any of these other heretics have to say that the Abrahamic covenant is null and void and all the promises given to Israel are now the quote unquote churches. That is a heresy and a lie from hell through Rome. So that is what happens to these two prophets. And Zechariah, Moses and Elijah, the transfiguration, and this is their future. We know one of them is absolutely Elijah because Christ said, Elijah shall truly come and restore all things. But if he will have it, Elijah's already come. And they've done to him what they will. Christ said himself that Elijah will truly come and restore all things. And of course he would say that because after all, it was Christ who, the Spirit of Christ who inspired Malachi to write these words. In Malachi chapter 5. Verse, Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So important is this ministry of Elijah that without it the Lord would curse the earth because the fathers of the nation of Israel and their sons will be turned one to another again. Elijah is one of these two prophets, most assuredly. But I'm convinced Moses is the other one by virtue of the transfiguration and by virtue of the power of the, of the witness that he has power to turn the waters to blood. I don't believe it's Enoch. Enoch has nothing to do with this because he was not a Hebrew. Enoch was seventh from Adam. He had nothing to do with the Abrahamic covenant. Nothing to do with the nation of Israel. It can't be Enoch. And first, furthermore, the book of Hebrews tells us that Enoch was translated, why? That he should not see death. Elijah is going to see death. Moses is going to see death. It's Moses and Elijah. And that's what's coming. Revelation 11 is literal. In a temple on earth to be built. 
as prophesied after the destruction of the second temple. 70 AD. Transfiguration. Christ helps us in your life. Love it. Brother Eric John Fells back with the broadcast today. And so we have reviewed what's coming in the future, and now we're going to step into the present and see how the devil is preparing the world for that future day. Now, as you know, I have much to say on this statutory de facto military government that was established here in America on March 9th, 1933. And it's been this military government by which the Pope has used American men and women to restore the Pope's temporal power around the world using its military industrial complex and its international unified intelligence services. That is what is ruling America today. That is the military government ruling our beloved, our blessed National Republic of the United States of America. Okay. And every patriot should not want to be subject to the military government. We want to be subject to a constitutional government, a civilian government that was ousted on March 9th, 1933 for the temporary emergency war powers declaration of FDR. First given on the 6th and then finalized on the 9th and approved and confirmed by Congress with their wicked emergency banking relief act that approved and confirmed every proclamation by FDR since March 4th, the day of his inauguration. So what we have here is we have this military government in place. And if you take my course, my private citizenship course, I show you how to go for protection under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to be a citizen of the United States without a contract implied or expressed that may have altered your status by operation of law to an inferior grade. I teach you all of this in my course so that you revert back to being truly a pristine private citizen of the United States protected by Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. This is our King's X. This is where we want to be. Because when we're there, we can't be used by the military government to restore the Pope's temporal power by way of fighting his crusades, being drafted, and fighting his crusades around the world. And I would add financing it with the income excise crusade tax. Because you realize everybody's financing the war effort. And everybody should be. As long as you're surety for a stranger, as long as you're this surety for this all caps entity created by the filed birth certificate in conjunction with the seizure of all registered property by FDR on March 6th with Proclamation 2039. So anyway, apart from all those specifics, the devil and his Pope of Rome, overseen by his obsidian Praetorian Guard, the Jesuit Order, has taken America, morphed it into an empire to wage wars around the world against designated enemies of the Pope of Rome and his temporal power. This very same military government has built Islam. It has built Saudi Arabia. It has built Soviet Red Russia. It has built socialist communist China. The very enemies to be used against us have been built by this military government serving the Pope of Rome. And it ought to anger you. It shouldn't scare you. It should anger you that someone has usurped our wonderful country by ousting our civilian government and in its place putting a military government which power is in substance unlimited except by squeaky little decisions of the Supreme Court with seven Roman Catholics on it right now. Yep. 
So with this in place, after the Jesuits imposed their military government, they made everybody, every person, every one of these artificial entities with its registered property, you, the private citizen, they made us all collateral on the day of the seizure, approved on the night. And now that we're collateral for the debt, for the public debt, gold no longer needed to be collateral. So what did FDR do with his Executive Order 6102? He issued that on April 5th, 1933, about less than a month after the military government was imposed. And then on that day, he issued an executive order under the authority of the Trading with the Enemy Act as amended by the Emergency Banking Relief Act, those two statutes, those two God Almighty statutes here in this country. That all gold must be turned in, all gold coin, gold certificates must be turned in by good old socialist communist May 1st day. The executive order issued on the 5th, and by the way, it had the Postmaster General uh, Farley. Farley was a fourth degree, not a Columbus. And that by May 1st, all you slaves, all you American people, better turn in your gold, boy. Better turn in your gold, step and fetch it. If you don't, you're going to get a $10,000 fine and go 10 years in jail if you don't turn in the gold. Because after all, you're conquered, and the first thing a conquering army does is it confiscates the public money, and that's right out of the Libra Code, of which they were secretly following its maxims. First thing a conquering army does, it confiscates all the public money. So they confiscated the gold. So now the collateral for the debt that they're going to run up, and in these first six months, they're going to run up the debt to five, spend $500 million. Spending the country out of debt. Where we're now, the people were enslaved. The more debt, the more slavery the people are in. And where are the lawyers telling you this? Where are the judges telling you this? Well, they're not going to tell you. You're just the enemy, man. They have no respect for you. <laughs> you're an enemy belligerent. Until you become a private citizen, you're just a dog in the street. So going on. Then they, in the first hundred days of FDR's administration, 15 socialist communist pieces of legislation were rammed through Congress by the Jesuits there and FDR working for the Pope and the Jesuits of Georgetown overseen by Jesuit Edmund Walsh. He signs all of them into law. And now, while this is going on, Dirty Joe Stalin, he's going to be recognized in December of 33 by FDR. So FDR is going to recognize the socialist communist government of that filthy scum, Joseph Stalin, who killed probably 60 million of his own Orthodox peoples. So the American empire can be used to build the Soviet empire. And you suckers like me to join the Air Force to pretend to fight against the Cold War and the Soviet invasion when this government built it. This military government built it. Thousands of evidence for that. You read even the John Birch stuff. Uh, none dare call it treason. And, and the second edition gives thousands of examples of this government, military government building Russia and China. But in 1939, something happens. Hitler invades Poland in October. Or September, was it September 1st, 1939? But FDR, what does he do? He creates a new office in Washington. And the name of this office is titled the Executive Office of the President of the United States. This is going to become the most powerful arm of the executive functioning in this military government of all Washington. There is no office more powerful 
than the executive office of the President of the United States. And the seal that it uses is the seal, is the one side of the great seal, quote unquote, put on the $1 bill in 1935. That's the seal of the military government. It's not the seal of the President of the United States. It's the seal of the executive office of the president. And this is the exact same seal that's used in every federal district court because they're sitting in military jurisdiction doing the bidding of their Caesar in Washington, D.C., the commander in chief in his legitimate office of president, but in a statutory military government. You with me? And so let's read a little bit about this executive office of the president of the United States, which you hear nothing about. This is off the web, off Wikipedia. Some of his stuff is pretty true. I maintain this is true. The executive office of the president, EOP, consists of the immediate staff of the current president of the United States and multiple levels of support staff reporting to the president. The executive office of the president is headed by the White House chief of staff, Currently, Dennis McDonough. The size of the White House staff has increased dramatically since 1939 and has grown to include an array of policy experts in various fields. This is the power center of the president acting as temporary commander-in-chief, ruling his temporary emergency war powers military government. This is his command center. Now, who is this Dennis McDonough? He is the White House Chief of Staff. Who is this guy? Well, again, Wikipedia, he's some white man here. Remember what I always told you? The most wicked men in the world are white. That will always hold true. The, most, the best men in the world, the men who do the best things in the world are white too. So it's a warfare between wicked and righteous white men. And you have to decide which side you're going to join if you're any other race. Who are you going to join? This, De this Richard McDonough, Dennis Richard McDonough, born December 2nd, 1969, is the 27th and current White House Chief of Staff, succeeding Jack Lew at the start of President Obama's second term. Jack Lew, the good Jew in the CFR, one of the Pope's court Jews, McDonough was born on December 2nd, 1969, in Stillwater, Minnesota. He is one of 11 children of Kathleen Mary O'Mahony, a good Irish Catholic girl, and William Joseph McDonough, another Irish Catholic man. So he's an Irish Roman Catholic American. The Irish Roman Catholics are always the most fanatical in their devotion to the Pope. That's why we have an Irish Roman Catholic vice president, vice president whose name is Joe Biden who has two honorary degrees from the Jesuits, one from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, the other from Scranton University in Scranton, to the utter disgrace of my beloved Pennsylvania. McDonough attended St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. I think that's a Roman Catholic University, where he played safety on the Johannes football team for Hall of Fame coach John uh, Gagli... Gagliardi. McDonough was a member of teams that won two conference titles in the Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. So he's a competitor. He's a team player. And that's what the Jesuits are always looking for. When they want to put somebody in a place of power, the question is, are, where, did we educate him? And are they a team player? So he's both of this. We read continuing. McDonough graduated from St. John's University with a Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude. He's a pretty smart guy. In history and Spanish in 1992. Perfect guy, speaks English and Spanish. He'll be able to facilitate the Spanish alien Roman Catholic invasion because he can talk to him in Spanish. He was raised a devout Catholic. He was raised in a devout Catholic family, Roman Catholic family. You say, big deal. I say it is a big deal because the Pope claims to have universal temporal power and that means every government on earth must submit to the Pope's temporal power. 
and he will shove it down your throat if you don't want it. Using a military government like this one to invade your country, to imprison your nationalistic leaders, to paint you with the brush of terrorist or anarchist or rebel, so that you submit to the dictator that they put in power there, loyal to the Pope. After graduation, McDonough traveled extensively throughout Latin America, that's Roman Catholic Latin America, and taught high school in Belize. The Jesuits run Belize, absolutely. Their leading guy there, I said, Jesuit educated from what my sources tell me. He then attended Georgetown University. What's that? Georgetown University is the greatest, most, most powerful Jesuit university in America. Georgetown University is the capital of the United States. It's the war room of the Jesuit order as they devise their plans to put upon it the Ameri put upon them the American people through Georgetown into the vaginal oval office of the White House, there into the office of the president's commander in chief, then to be taken up all these acts to Congress, and then they pass them like the good moguls that they are. That's right, they're moguls. And traitors. There's not one congressman that's ever told you we've been under military government. The guy that came close was trafficant, and he recently died. Roman Catholic that he was. He was a disobedient Catholic boy, so they put him in federal prison. Don't you think you, you're going to get over because you're Roman Catholic, man? They'll put you in prison or kill you just as fast as anybody else that resists their power, as they did with Roman Catholic JFK, which I prove in my book, Vatican Assassins. Get a copy. Okay. He attended Georgetown University, graduated with an MSFS degree from the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. My, my. Who's Edmund A. Walsh? Edmund A. Walsh was a most powerful Jesuit from 1920s to 19, late 1950s. He was there in Russia overseeing the establishment of the Soviet government from 1922 to 1924. He was busy putting Lenin and Stalin and, and all those other guys in power there in Russia, particularly Stalin, because Stalin then would kill every Jew involved except one, Lazar Kaganovich. Other than that, Stalin was a white Gentile uh, Georgian, used by the Jesuits to annihilate all the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church that were in Russia. Okay? Wonderful man. Walsh was there putting him in power from 22 to 24, getting ready to eliminate Lenin so Stalin could come to power. The School of Foreign Service, this was a school of foreign service that was involved in the translations at Nuremberg of the war trials there after World War II, so that any hint of priestial con contribution into the Reich would be completely censored out. And Walsh was there in the, in the, in, as, a, as an army colonel making sure that would happen there in Nuremberg. This is the school. Jesuit priest Edmund A. Walsh and Knight of Malta founded the School of Foreign Service that the most that the most uh, influential men in, in uh, diplomacy have graduated from it. This is Dennis McDonough, head of White House Chief of Staff, running the executive office of the president. This guy is a bad dude. This guy is powerful. This guy has absolute access in and out of Georgetown University to the president's office anytime he needs to see him. And that president is John de Goya. He is a Knight of Malta. He was educated extensively by the Jesuits, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. You check out the annual report. This guy's powerful. And he tells Step and Fetch it, the mulatto, Barry Davis Obama, he tells him what to do, boy. Just step and fetch it, you boy. Just sign this in the law, boy. And Joe Biden will be out there at your left hand. Make sure you're going to do it correctly now, boy. 
just do what you're told, boy. And we'll have all these white people deceived into thinking, the black man did it to them when we really did it, us white Roman Catholics of the white power structure of the Pope. <laughs> Amen? So, he goes on, he's aged to all these people. And uh, with Obama's election, he joined the National Security Council's head of strategic communication. You know what that means? That means he can communicate with the Pope anytime he wants to. In the CIA, they call it Vatican Desk. The guy that's head of the Vatican Desk can, can, communicates with the CIA right to the Vatican. The guy in the past was James Angleton of the movie that was made, Good Shepherd. Goes on here and says, uh, October 22nd, 2010, President Barack Obama announced that McDonald would be replacing Thomas E. Donilon as Deputy National Security Advisor, who was leaving his position to succeed General James L. Jones. Jones is trained by Jesuits in Georgetown, too, as National Security Advisor. McDonald was seen in photos of the White House Situation Room taken during the monitoring of the SEAL operation in Pakistan that resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. No, that was the fake death of some, of some double. Because all those SEALs involved in killing Osama, they all died. Well, didn't they? Didn't they die, SEAL teams? Uh-huh. Using you as suckers. That ought to upset you, SEALs. I have a former Navy SEAL that wants to come on my broadcast. Interesting guy. Okay, then in uh, January 25th, 2013, Obama appoints Dennis McDonough as his chief of staff. McDonough, in February, urged lawmakers to quickly confirm Chuck Hagel and John O'Brennan. John O'Brennan is another Georgetown Jesuit Irish Roman Catholic to their posts in Obama's national security team, expressing grave concern about the delays. Here, quickly, quickly appoint Chuck Hagel, appoint John O'Brennan, all these Jesuit co coadjutors, appoint him to the national security team. That's right. Because these are the Jesuit coadjutors directing all foreign policy to our detriment. And this Irish Roman Catholic, Dennis McDonough, is overseeing it all for the Jesuits of Georgetown and telling Obama, step and fetch it, what to do. Well, when was this created? When was this executive office of the president created? The reorganization. Roosevelt, uh, based on the recommendations of a presidency commission panel of political science and public administration experts that were known as the Brownlow Committee, Roosevelt was able to get Congress to approve the Reorganization Act of 1939. The act led to reorganization plan number one, which created the executive office of the president, which reported directly to the president. This executive office of the president was created in 1939. And it reports directly to the office of the president. The EPO, EOP encompassed two subunits at its outset, the White House office and the Bureau of the Budget. Bureau of the Budget. All right. The predecessor of today's Office of Management and Budget, which had been created in 1921 and originally located in the Treasury Department. It absorbed most of the functions of the National Emergency Council. So, this operation had the brain trusters in it, all socialist communism. From 1933 to 1939, even as he greatly expanded the scope of the federal government's policies and powers in response to the Great Depression, that's called socialist communism. Roosevelt muddled through, quote, his brain's trust of top advisors, although working directly for the president, they're appointed to vacant positions in agencies and departments. From 1939 through the present, the situation changed dramatically. New units within the EOP were created, some by statute, some by executive order of the president. Among the most important are the Council of Economic Advisors in 1946, the National Security Council and its staff in 1947, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative in 1963, the Council of Environmental Quality, 1970. The Office of Science and Technology Policy, 1976. That controls all the UFOs. 
the Office of Administration, 1977, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, 1989. Under George W. Bush, additional units were added, such as the Office of Homeland Security in 2001. The Executive Office of the President controls the Pope's Department of Homeland Security, the coming SS Gestapo and KVD in this country that's going to be rounding up millions of Americans and send them to concentration camps once they justify their martial law. And guess who's running it? Jesuits to their most loyal Irish Roman Catholics like Dennis McDonough. That's the executive office of the president. And you need to know about it. And now you do. But Eric John Phelps, thank you for tuning in to the broadcast today. I have a book, Vatican Assassins, wounded in the house of my friends. Please go to my website, vaticanassassins.org. Read some articles. Go to the bookstore. Purchase some things. Uh, go to my 247worldradio.com forward slash mobile. And if you do that, you can immediately have the broadcast on your iPhone or your phone without an app. Tell your friends, 247worldradio.com forward slash mobile, and you'll pick it up. If you want to be a supporter, send your check to RBT, Reformation Bible Trust, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Want to be a regular supporter? You can sign up on the website, be a monthly supporter. And I thank you for those of you who have. A few more of you have. Thank you so much. May the Lord bless you. Put you on my prayer list, and I'll be praying for you regularly. And lastly, I need your prayers. Pray for me. Those of you who know the Lord through his Son, I need your prayers 60 seconds a day in this matter in court to be seen as the private citizen. And pray for Sylvia H. Rambo, the federal district judge, the illustrious judge in Harrisburg, she might do the right thing. Until Friday, may the Lord bless you. As you serve according to his word, the AV 61, Reformation Bible. Aaron.